Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Sales Masters Podcast. This is going to be the hub for any professional out there who's looking to get to that next level within their business. Not only are they going to be dropping tips, but bringing in the absolute titans of industry. Big names out there, like the people like David Meltzer, leaders of their industry. We're going to share with you exactly how they got there, the problems they faced, how they overcome it, so you can use them within your business. We're going to be dropping weekly gems that you can go off to help you get up to that next level. And we look forward to having you here on the journey. Hi, guys, and welcome to the Sales Masters podcast. Today, we are joined by the amazing Spencer Lodge. Uh, Spencer Lodge is someone who has not only built a 100 million pound business, host of SpencerLodge.tv, the Make It Happen book, which I have here on my mantelpiece, and the Make It Happen University. Spencer, welcome. Thank you very much. That's a nice introduction. We aim to please. How's things? Good, thank you. Yeah, how are you? I'm really good. Really good, thank you. Just enjoyed having a chat and then I suddenly realised if we didn't jump into the podcast, I'd probably chat to you all day and then we wouldn't actually get a podcast done. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, most of the people that are going to be listening are sales professionals, business owners, people that are looking to get a bit more out of it. So I've devised a few questions. Hopefully we can add a little bit of value out there. Um, I mean, first and foremost, was this all the plan to start with being in sales? Did you fall into sales? Was it a plan behind it? How did you get into all what you do now? My grand plan of world domination was to become a ski instructor. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, I left school without any call, well, 10 level, and um, wanted to be a ski instructor more than anything. Did that for a little while. And then summer came. I remember my mum kicked me out of bed. She's like, you've got to get a job. And I'm like, I've got a job. She's like, it's August. There's no snow. You're not a ski instructor in August. <laughs> and so she got me three job interviews. Um, one was at, uh, in Bishop Stork for the BMW dealership as a trainee car salesman. The other one was an estate agency as a trainee estate agent. And the other one was uh, office equipment in London. And I took the, the one at the BMW dealership because it came with a 316i BMW. And back then in 1988 or 89, <laughs> Over the was, moon with that. It was red with brown interior. It was the mutts nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I loved it. I had a blouk punk stereo. <laughs> so I was living, living the dream. And um, I got fired after a month for having the wrong attitude. <laughs> so that was, that was the end of that. And then the other next job I took was the, the office equipment job and because that came with a company car as well. And I was commuting to London every day and I fell in love with sales. It was like the best training I'd ever had in my life. I hadn't really had much training in anything. And um, it just resonated with me, connected with me. You know, we, we had to go door knocking every morning for a lot of people. That, there were 16 trainees that started at the same time. And like at the end of the first week, like eight or nine of them were like, sod that, I'm not knocking on doors. I had a patch in London, which was EC3, so in the city. So I was going into big corporations every day. You know, I wasn't going into little boutique businesses. And um yeah, 100, 100 door knocks a day and 100 cold calls a day. And that was my life for 18 months. And I started to make money. And I, when, I remember when I walked into the office on the first day, there was this, this white uh, whiteboard on the side here with all the names of the salespeople and how much money they'd earned that month. And it was like 20 grand, and like 30 grand. And I'm like, they got that wrong. That's, they put that number underneath month. They should put that under year, yeah? And then I, no, that's monthly. And I'm like, what? They're earning that much money every month. And uh, that was very attractive to me at that time. And then um, I was earning, what was I earning? This was, this was probably 1991, 92. I was earning about 50 grand a year. All my mates were probably earning 20 grand a year. I was living the dream. Everything was great. But I was spending more than I could earn. I didn't understand money. And then I went to a recruitment consultancy in Tottenham Court Road called PMA Recruitment, Positive Mental Attitude Recruitment. I met a guy called John Celeste and Doug Brain. They went, well, if you want to earn more money, you need to go into franking machines. And I was like, what's a franking machine? And so Pitney Bowes go, went for an interview down there. They didn't give me a job. And then they're like financial services. And so I went for an interview in Ipswich in a place called Dalling Who. Um, and I was interviewed by this lady called Bryony. And then the next day I got a call saying, Spencer, look, we want people over there to 25, you're 23, you're too young, come back in two years. And so the next day I went back to the office and I waited for the owner of the company to come, sat there for three hours, eventually came. And... Um, I just said, your recruiter won't give me a job and I want a job. 
and uh, we started chatting and then the, the coincidence happened which caused the journey and my grandfather had just had a stroke and he was in the hospital in Gallywood in Essex and his father had just had a stroke and his father was in the same hospital in really? Essex and that came out in conversation and we went to the hospitals together to see our relative fathers and grandfathers and he said to me um you've got to be in Hong Kong in a week's time um if you're there on time this was back before the internet and stuff so getting an airline ticket was like go to the travel agent you know and all that kind of nonsense go and buy some clothes that would you'd wear in Hong Kong and uh when I did some training, I remember, I remember when I was first learning about financial services, I was, I came home for the first day of my training course. And I said to my mum, mum, do you realise that people have to pay money to save money? It's nuts that is, isn't it? And she's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if you invest your money in something, you have to pay to invest it. And she's like, it was, how do you think they make money? And all of a sudden I went, oh, that's how much, <laughs> <laughs> that's how much I didn't know about financial services. <laughs> I find it fascinating with a lot of the stuff because you, when you say about walking into the room and you see people 20 grand on the board, and I think a lot of people that go into sales, I think a lot of people in education don't ever get put to that place where they think they're going to earn six figures, quarter of a million, million pound, right? And it's that exposure for a lot of people in sales is the first time they've met someone apart from, you know, the, the old money that had a lot of houses, but actually seeing physical value figures next to it, and especially when they're young. And that's, I think, one of the biggest exposures for people, right? And I do you think if you got exposed to that quicker, you'd always been drawn to it? Or do you think it was just by convenience, but you'd try a bit of car sales, you tried all that sort of stuff first, and you already knew you wanted sales anyway? The car sales people, when I was in that office, were earning like 50 grand a year, which was like, that was still amazing. It was like, like 50 grand a year selling cars. Wow. Or 35 to 50. And even then, it was just like, back in those days, a lot of money. But yes, when I walked into that office and it was just like, and outside, outside the office with like 911s and, and other fancy cars. And I go in the office and, you know, there's, there's dudes with flash watches on and pinstripe suits and stuff thinking they're the, they're the bee's knees. And I just walked into that environment. And I was like, wow. And I saw the numbers on the board. And then I was the trainee of the top salesman. So I worked with this guy called David Thornton, who was from Scarborough. Um, and he was a grumpy git. And he'll, he'll, he'll openly admit that to this very day. But um, I worked out very quickly where he was weak and I could be strong. And uh, we formed a, a formidable partnership. And, and I was very loyal to him the, the period of time I worked there. And um, he taught me taught me a lot. He taught me how to sell um, in a very different way to the, the way that I think your your audio tapes back in the Zig Ziglar days yeah. were taught you. It was it was a real clinical, serious process of, of, of evaluating the client. I mean, it was all B to B. So, um, but yeah, it was it was just it was so exciting. I mean, it was so exciting. I I just like I I I just couldn't imagine ever doing anything else. And I remember because I'd been on the phones all the time. I got to Hong Kong and was working in the Far East. And I remember my first day on the phones. I had, so I was just giving some names and numbers. Call them, see if you can book them in. And um, I made 14 appointments on my first day. And everyone in the office, it was like tumbleweeds were going through. They're just sitting there <laughs> staring at me. Because no one made more than three or four appointments a day. And I'm like, wow, this is so easy. Because in London, when I'm pitching people B2B for office equipment, people are like, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. You know, all you used to get was abuse. When I got, when I got to the Far East, I picked the phone up and spoke to a, a, another expat, which is what I did, the expat investment advice. They were like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting. You come and see me. And then, and then I phoned the next person up. Yeah, okay, no problem at all. Yeah, you can come and see me. And it was like, why do they keep saying yes? And uh, all of a sudden, I realized all of that, all of those skills that I learned, all that training that I had, that resilience yeah. I was taught, dealing with rejection and understanding that it was a, it was a tool to success, um, enabled me then to go into another industry where there was much less competition and much bigger money, and um, and I was able to smash it. I love it, and I, I think it's interesting when where people do their training, how they do their training sets that tempo, right? You, I was, my kid had to go, he went to a football camp this summer and he's seven and he got put in a group with 12 and 13 year olds and got battered about for five weeks. And he didn't really enjoy it. He wanted to play football, couldn't do it. Now he's out playing with seven year olds. He's flying because he's had experience of how hard it can be trying to run into someone who's twice your size and bouncing off them, right? Going to slide in and just embarrassing you with their skills because they're quicker, they're lighter. And with sales, it's very much like that. And I think when people come from a reverse, they come in and it's been low training, 
no real expectations, no set goals. It's an uphill battle for a lot of these people. I mean, if anyone's listening now and they probably haven't maybe had the training or what you've just said sounds daunting because they haven't, what would be your advice to anyone now that knows, do you know what? There's a big level up there, which I'm nowhere near. What would be your advice to them? Um, I think, first of all, you must... Look, I met a girl one night in, in, in the city. I was in a bar. It's five o'clock on a Friday. Wine bar, city of London, standard stuff. She was just gorgeous. I just saw her across the bar, and she was stunning. She was this little, slim, dark brown bar, big brown eyes, just just Beautiful. And I, and I looked at her and my mate said to me, go and talk to her. I'm like, no, I'm not going to talk to her, you know. And, um, and uh, I had a beer and then I had another beer. And uh, four beers later, it's like three hours later, I'm, I'm going to go and talk to her. And I walked over to her and I was like, hi, how are you? Can I buy you a drink? She's like, yeah. She said, what took you so long? I'm like, what? She said, you've been staring at me for the last three hours. I was wondering when you were going to come and talk to me. <laughs> I was like, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> so like you look back across the bar at your mates and you're like, yes. Anyway. <laughs> and, um, and so I asked her what she did for a living. She was a receptionist or a secretary or something in an architectural firm, Jones Lang La Salle or something. And um, she that's what she did. And so I got to know her, about, asked about her family, asked about her job, all the rapport building stuff. And then she said to me, what do you do for a living? And I said, uh, I'm a salesman. And she just looked at me and she went, oh God, why did I have to meet a salesman? I was like, well, what were you hoping for? She said, I don't know, investment banker, lawyer, something. And I said to her, your business is, is architecture. And so I would guess that your company has clients that use your services. Would that be right? She's like, yeah, I said, and so there must be people in your company that have to find the clients. Would that be right? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, if you have no clients, how much money does your company make? She's like, well, I'd assume none. And so no clients equals no revenue. And so would you have a job? And she went, maybe not. And I'm like, so respect the salesman because those guys are the guys that go out, they bust their balls. Okay, they go through emotional highs and lows because lots of them are on commission. They have to feed their family. They have to put a roof over their head. They've got to pay their car payments. All that kind of stuff still has to go on like normal people. But they have all of those highs and lows. And if those people don't do their job, you don't have a job. And she just stopped for a second and she was like, fair point. And so in a, in a direct answer to your question is, Selling is a skill set and a mindset. There is no such thing as a gift of the gab. There's no such thing as a natural born salesperson. Yes, there are people that can talk. There are people that are charming. There are people that are chatty. But selling is a profession and you need to learn the skills to be good at it. And if you're not making many sales in your business or you're not getting many clients to your business, it's because you're not very good at sales. Now, picking up my book and reading it ain't going to fix it. OK, just like picking up a book about how to fly an aeroplane ain't going to teach you how to fly an aeroplane. You've, <laughs> got, you've got to go and learn. The book will give you insights, but you've got to go and learn. And whether that's in a classroom online uh, and then learn tools that you then apply, learn more tools that then you apply. But you have to go through that process if you want to get results. And it's no different to any other industry. You can't just wing it if you want to be really successful. And so. For me, everybody needs to accept and, and, and respect the fact that it's a skill. And lots of people that are in salary jobs that might be listening to this right now, shame on you for looking down your nose at salespeople. Okay, They're the backbone of industry. They're the people that bring the money through the door and they need to be respected. I agree. Hear, hear. Um, and I think for a lot of people out there, people have a perspective about sales and salespeople, but you fell into it because you had nothing else. Now, for some people out there, a lot of people did fall into. I fell into sales, but it doesn't mean it's any less of a profession. But it is one that doesn't require you to go to a school before you can become active. Like if you're going to become a doctor, you can't just go out on the ward and start winging it, right? With sales, you can take a job where you can learn one thing, start doing it straight away, start getting better, start like you can. In the same way, a plumber can go out on a YTS, yeah, right? Look, 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 no, you, no look, roles. Hold on a minute. Let's look at most professions. Chartered accountants, plumbers, bricklayers, carpenters, bus drivers, um, policemen, um, nearly every day, electricians, any of those trades, secretaries, admin assistants, um, database researchers, 
who the fudging hell is at school sitting? Oh, I can't wait to become a bricklayer. <laughs> oh, man, that's the future. That's what a load of nonsense. Nearly everything people start doing, they fall into. You know, my, my eldest is at uni, my youngest is at uni. The eldest is clear on what she wants to be. My youngest hasn't got a clue. She's fallen into film at Met Film in London, where she's learning to film. Okay, why? Because it sounded like a good idea at the time. All right. She's going to come out with that university degree. She's still probably not going to know exactly what she wants to do. Nobody, nobody at the very beginning is really clear. It's an evolution. It might start a bit younger for some people, a bit older for others, but it's an evolution. I'm pretty sure people don't start off at the age of 16 years old. So the most important thing in my life is to become a doctor. I'll give you an example. I've had two operations on my back, two spinal surgeries. And my, my surgeon, Dan, the neurosurgeon in Harley Street, And I said to him one day when we were having a coffee, I'm like, why'd you become a neurosurgeon? He's like, you know what? I studied medicine. And once you've done your first part of studying medicine, you have to choose an area to go into. And I read a book about this neurosurgeon that was a multimillionaire. I thought, that's good enough for me. And I'm like, so so you've got these these people that open up your backs and cut your blooming spine apart and whatnot. But Well, I read a book, sounded like good fun to me. And so, you know, so I don't believe this whole, you know, again, it's that whole bashing salespeople thing, you know. Let's bash, oh, you fell into it because there was nothing else you could do. Shut up. Most of the things you've done in your life, you fell into. Now, how many people go to university and study biomedical science and then become something completely different? Architecture, engineering, all this kind of thing. Don't use any of what they've studied. End up working in a supermarket. <laughs> oh, man. In, in a million different things, but not what they studied. Yeah, I, I think it, my brother went to Cambridge Uni and he came out and for two years, about 18 months after, he literally worked in the local Morrisons um, doing like checkout and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, Cambridge seat clearly paid off. But it's not exactly a dull uni even. I thought, if you've gone all the way through that, that must be a kick. The sit there at the checkout. How can you be doing this? I thought you went to Cambridge. Yeah, I did. I've worked out really well for you. Um, what would you say one of the big misconceptions are for the way people sell now? Do you think there's set things that we see? Because there is a lot of people out there that come into sales, which I think they come money first. And there's other people who don't even understand sales and I think they can take a long time. So do you have certain things where you think people have a real misconception on what sales actually is? I I don't know many jobs for an entrepreneur that aren't more important than being a salesperson. So I think you you have to, you've got salespeople working for other people and then you've got entrepreneurs that are salespeople themselves. If, you know, if we went out and started a business, David, we might have to raise finance. We've got to go and sell that idea to whoever's going to lend us the money. So, I think that understanding that <clears throat> everybody is in sales in some way, that really getting a real understanding of the fact that you are a salesperson yourself and you may be a good one, an average one or a great one. And, and just respecting that that's what you have to do. Okay. And have to be good at to make your business grow and be successful is, is a place people fight. All right. It, it's not something they, they, they embrace, you know, and, because they don't embrace it, then, then there's resistance to it. When you look at salespeople that get into sales in a job because of money, well, again, it's come back to it. You know, my neurosurgeon decided to become a neurosurgeon because he knew someone that was a multimillionaire. So was he motivated by money? You know, there are some people in this world that are just out on a mission. So nurses, for example, they're out on a mission. Okay, they're not motivated by money. All right, they can't be because nurses don't get paid very much. School teachers don't get paid very much. But most people that go to work leave companies to go and get a slight promotion and a bit of a pay rise to go and work at the competing company down the road from uh, assistant manager to, to, to manager, okay, for an extra three grand a year. Well, what was the motivation there? There was money involved, yeah. If, if the opportunity was to go somewhere else and have a better job title and to earn less money, how easy would that move be? So I think that, that, that lots of people are motivated by money. Uh, the reality in sales is that most people fail because they don't take it seriously. Most people fail because they don't like rejection. It hurts them, you know, criticism, critique in any way from husband, wife to anybody else. People don't like to accept criticism. And so I think comedians are, are great examples of people that know how to deal with resilience because comedians die on stage in front of people. You know, if I go on stage in front of people, it doesn't resonate with everyone. Nothing's really said. You know, you go on stage and you tell a joke and no one laughs at it. It's like, 
Oh, <laughs> you know, the audience have turned against you. It's like bit... <laughs> and we've all seen that, you know, we've seen it either yes. on telly or we've actually been in a, you know. It's that awkward, club. that deadly silence. And then, you know, imagine having to deal with that night after night until you get good. Just like 50 people or 100 people looking at you going. <laughs> I mean, salespeople don't have it that bad, but they do have to deal with rejection. Well, I think we've, it's funny we say about the comedians because at least, I mean, when you think about what they do, to, when we look at the top comedians, you watch those shows and you realise, and you sit, you know, you watch one and it's perfectly timed and you feel like it was just, they were just ad lib, they're just going, they're just chatting. And then you watch the next version in New York and it's exactly the same. And you almost feel, oh, cheated. <laughs> yeah, you forget how practiced, how rehearsed, how handcrafted every single point of this is and i think a lot of people don't give enough credit behind it and we talk about things i talk to people in sales especially about having a structure having a foundation know what you're going to say understand it. people are, oh well i just like to free flow and be me you go that doesn't work in any job right you go oh, i'm just going to yeah. cook this you're a chef i'm just going to cook this steak however i like i'm just going to chuck it in some water and throw it again like you're not just going to randomly do things there's a way to doing everything right and I've, I would love to know what the block is for a lot of people in sales where they like to just be them. They think it's, I've got to break the mold or do something crazy. Someone goes, this is a clear way that it works. And they go, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then they wonder why they fail, right? Do you, why do you think people are different in sales and other industries with that? Because if you're playing baseball and someone tells you how to smack it out of the park, people are good at doing the same thing, right? Well, uh, again, it's in, it's like going back to school. You know, some of your teachers are really resonated with you and some of your teachers didn't. And the ones that resonated, you worked harder for and you delivered more for. Um, so it's, it's about being taught by the right person. But it's also understanding, you know, you're, you're an apprenticeship and you've got to learn. And then what you learn, you've got to apply. And if you choose not to do that, that's a conscious choice that you've made. Now, if you don't like the way... Uh, or, or what you've got to do or what you've got to say because it makes you feel uncomfortable everything feels uncomfortable the first time you do it the first time you fart in front of a girlfriend it's uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> it's, it then gets a little bit easier <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's the same as anything you know when you do it at first it's uncomfortable the first time you have to stand on stage and speak the first time you speak in a clubhouse room you know it's oh a microphone's on someone's asked me a question the first time you have to ask a question you know the first time you do nearly everything it's uncomfortable but the reality is with everything you get comfortable by practice and learn from people that know what they're doing take their knowledge and skills and apply it and if you've got a great leader in business even if you don't like him but you know he's really successful listen and learn and extract it and apply it and, and lots of salespeople just don't want to do the work they want the result they see those big numbers on the board oh, i want to earn 20 grand and then what happens is they slowly go into that phase of like i must be doing something dodgy to get the 20 yeah grand. they think there's an alternative thing there's it's a like, hidden there's a hidden folder he's getting more leads than anybody else he's, he's only doing the big deals yeah, that's something going on. He gets a bigger commission than I do or whatever it is. It's just like, can you just shut the fuck up whining? All right, stop whining. Stop complaining. Stop bitching. If you want to be successful at anything, you've got to do the work. And people go, oh, I'd rather work smart than work hard. Of course, duh. But working smart doesn't mean being lazy. Yeah. Okay. You might need to be smart 12 hours a day to be successful. Doesn't mean you can work less hours. It means you have to implement and execute. Yeah, I agree. Um, so if we look now at Spencer Lodge uh, in your early 40s that you are now, and we go back to the Spencer Lodge when you were, say, early career, uh, sort of about 18 to 20, if you could go back now and chuck in some advice, what were you telling to do there? Because you come into sales, you're doing well, but I'm guessing there's things you know now, but you think, ah, oh, if I knew that back then or if I had that mindset, things would have been maybe even better. What would you give your advice? Um. <clears throat> Probably two, two of the bigger mistakes I made were um, I wasn't sensible with money in the early days. I started to earn a lot of money and I spent a load of money. So I wasn't, you know, I remember my, I was in, I was in the Far East. My first commission check was about 1800 quid. The next month, my commission check, I think was four and a half grand. And I'm like, oi, oi, savaloy. And then my, <laughs> my third commission check was 28,000. 
Now, my mum was looking after my bank account and she called me. I sent me a fax or something. It says, Spence, 28,000 pounds hit your bank account um, from your company. I think they might have made a mistake. And I'm like, yeah, they must have made a mistake. They, they, so my mum said, call the company and tell them they've sent money to you by mistake. I'm like, I'm not calling them. <laughs> She's like, here you are. And so I called, I called my employer. And I said, I think you made a mistake. You paid 28,000 pounds into my bank account. What do you want me to do? And they're like, no, no, that's your quarterly bonus. And I was like, what's my money? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, real? Is that for real? Is that my money? And they're like, yeah, it's your money. I bought a first class ticket home for the weekend. I'd never flown first class in my life. First class, British Airways, Bangkok to London. Thank you very much. Spunked a load of money and did stupid things because spending money is stupid. I mean, I bought all the flash cars, all the nonsense. So I would I'd really counsel and coach myself on, on, on how, how to look after money because I should have been back then. When, what, what, what overheads do you have when you're 24, 25 years old? You've got the whole world, you know, you're in a load of money, you're paying rent. You ain't, you ain't got debts or responsibilities. You know, you haven't got any of that shit. So I should have been investing back then. I didn't do that. Um, and another piece of advice I would probably give myself is that um, arrogance is really ugly. And you, you, you need to learn how to manage that and don't allow yourself to become arrogant because as much as it's confused with confidence, nine times out of 10, a confident man is seen as arrogant as well. And so, um, yeah, that, they're, they're probably the two, two most important things if I look back. Um, and uh, don't get married when you're 26 because you're too young and stupid. And you? <laughs> you, men shouldn't be allowed to get married before the age of 40. It should be banned, you know. Men getting married and have kids, not till you're 40. You don't know you're growing up enough. My friend of mine's younger brother's 19. He's just got married. And I'm like, literally been married about two months. And he's already, he's already like, what have I done? Bless them. We won't name names as I might listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you must have had people in your in your life that's come through uh, that have really been inspiration. You've mentioned a couple of people. I mean, who have been the top people that you look now and that really made that impact for, for how you've got to, to what you've done? So David Schilling and Eric Pomfret taught me how to sell. So Eric, on the first day of work, said to me, I want you to make 100 cold calls. No, I want you to knock on 100 doors, come back to the office, make 100 cold calls, and I want you to get 100 people to say no to you. I was like, what? He said, I want you to get 100 people to say no. And I was like, well, get 100 people to say no. He went, yeah, go on, I bet you can't. Anyway, so got to the end of the day, got 100 no's, gave me high fives, said, see you tomorrow. Next day, I want you to get 99 people to say no to you. All right, I bet you can't. Anyway, got to the end of the day, 99 said no. One person had said yes to a conversation, gave me a high five. And, um, and then the next day, and slowly it was starting to sink in. He's that like, next day, he's like, I want you to go and get 99 people again to say no to you. So go, go and find as many no's as you can. And what he was teaching me was to understand that rejection plays such a big role. And if you know how to deal with rejection emotionally and psychologically, then you can use it as a weapon. And so um, he taught me that. That was really profound. And David Schillingus, we trained from 6.30 to late every morning in the office it was called the Early Bastard Club. So all the Chinese used to, used to, <laughs> I love the time. <laughs> we used to come in early in the morning. Mm. Bear in mind, this is back in the 80s. And uh, he was just such a great guy teaching me how to sell. Uh, so I've got a huge amount of respect for those guys. I then got into financial services. I was taught a lot by a guy called Tony Mustafa, who was a, a Turkish guy from the UK. He was, he was, he was a great teacher. Um, calm and, 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 and precise. And so I've got a lot, a lot of learnings from him. And then as I moved my, through my career, various mentors came along, uh, along the way and taught me and, and, and developed me as a, as a professional, as a, as a person. And they, they all ha, ha, had a big role to play in my life because at that time in my life, they were pivotal, you know? And so I'm very, very, I'm very grateful for those people. They, they really are really are important and like we all have people on our journey I, I write in my book about these people as well and they play a significant part and they need they need to be recognized as well because a lot of the time these types of people are unsung heroes yeah and I think a lot of the time they don't necessarily realize the impact that they've made when I, I think about some of the people the little things that have happened and the points when people have been there for them it might just have been a day like, I remember something my dad, my dad, remember, we had this chat once when I was a kid. I spoke to him about when I was about 16. I was like, stay away. He's like, I don't even remember it. Because what was impactful for me, to him, was just another day him chatting to his son. With me, I was ready. Yeah. I was listening. 
and and hearing all about stuff. So I think it's great you do that. I really do. Dave, um, Dave, 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 interestingly enough, uh, I, I was contacted by a guy here in Dubai about two years ago. He said, look, I know a guy called David Chillingus. He's a friend of mine. He said, I should talk to you about sales training. And I was like, David Chillingus? What? Because this what, it's an unusual surname, right? And I'm like, David, that I used to work for when I was a kid. He's like, yeah. He sends his regards and he told me to contact you. And I was like, shit, man. And I've not spoken to him since I was 23 years old. Really? And so I found him on LinkedIn and I sent a message. David, I'm not sure you remember who I am. Um, I worked for you all these years ago. Da, 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 da. Um, I just had an interesting conversation with somebody that, that mentioned your name. And I wanted to reach out and just say thank you for all you did for me because it means a lot. I got a message back the following day on LinkedIn and it was, Spence, <laughs> how the devil are you? I've been following your career over the course of the last few years, last 30 years. I'm so proud of what you've achieved, Spence. You, you were always going to make it, you, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I sobbed, like, honestly, sat like I'm sat here right now. And I cried my eyes out. And then... Um, uh, we had got the opportunity to get on the phone and talk to him. And it was a beautiful conversation. It was, it was really very special. And it was very meaningful for me that, that not only has someone given me their time to teach me, to, to develop me, but also they remembered me after 25 years, whatever it was, of being in another part of the world. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because we often, I, I always think with people out there, I have conversations, I spoke at a mental health, like just a group of like six people, just a small group, mental health, um, spoke about things I'd gone through and stuff. And I'm really bad at judging. In a sales process, I can judge it because you know what questions to ask, you can get feedback. So I just spoke to this group, told my story, talking about things. And at the end, I'm like, I don't even know how this has gone. <laughs> like I was completely like, I really laid my cards on the table, really opened up. You feel quite exposed. And so... Afterwards, I was said to my friend who was hosting it, I said, like, I don't know how that went. And she went, it's unbelievable. She goes, I've known you for like nine years. I didn't know half the little things. And then I started getting these messages through every single one in the group. My God, you've really blown me away. You've really done this and it's really impacted. And it's crazy sometimes that when we are our most vulnerable and that we really put ourselves out there, it does get rewarded. But we're not great at telling each other that, are we? Like, Sometimes I, I don't say it to people, people can impact me. And I'm like, oh, that was really good. And you think it, but we don't say it. And it's such a weird thing for people to do. And I think especially for men, right? We're, we, we, and we're all deadpan faced as well, aren't we? We just sit there yeah. and go, like, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, really interesting. So what would you say last few years, not necessarily because of Corona, but it's just in general, what's been one thing which you for within the business has been a challenge or how, what you've had to overcome um, it recently, but, but you wouldn't mind sharing? Uh, my own demons. Um, uh -huh. are probably the things that I've had to overcome because going into lockdown was, was difficult for me. And whilst I was on, you know, Zoom for 12 hours a day doing business all over the world, it, uh, I don't, I don't cope well with that type of environment. And people say, Spence, you live on the beach, you're in a big house for Christ's sake. It's not like you're in a one bed flat. And okay, I get that. But you're, that, that space, whether it's, you know, a thousand square feet or 10,000 square feet or a hundred thousand square feet, it's still the space that you, your boundaries is. That's what you've got to live with. And so I found, I found that challenge and I found, I, I, I found it very lonely. And I think like many men, you know, my, my wife is, Awesome. She's an incredible human being. She's bright, smart, just, just, just an amazing person. But she doesn't get my industry. And so she's not somebody who I can sit and talk to. Or I can talk to her, but she doesn't really understand yeah. it. And so it's hard for her to comprehend. So then who, who else do you talk to? So I think my, 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 my own demons were, were, were challenging for me. That, that element of loneliness was very hard for me. Um, I'm very fortunate, you know, I'm very fortunate in a way that I own a bunch of businesses that are run by people for me. And so the interaction I have with those businesses is every other day on the phone. Uh, once one of them in one part of the world is once a week on the phone. The other one is every other day. And it's kind of that kind of stuff. So I don't have that much interaction with the day-to-day -day running of any of the businesses, which is a position I wanted to create. Yeah. But, but it's probably not the best position for me to be in. Because I need to get my hands dirty. Yeah, like being in uh, the hub of it. Yeah, all. yeah, and and I'm not. I'm, I'm, 
I'm a chairman of a group of companies and that sounds a bit fancy, but actually it sucks, you know? And, and even what, because think, you're out, you're in it, but you're not in it. Yeah, you know, you're in it, but you're not in it. You know, um, the CEO, even, even the CEO is, uh, I, you know, the role that I should have in my businesses is that I should be running the sales force. Yeah. That, that's, that's the job that I, I should be doing. If you look at all of my companies, um, that's the, if I go into any of them, then it would be Spencer runs the sales force because that's, that's where my, my core competencies are. But um, so, yeah, so I suppose that that has been a challenge. The, the, the blessing over the last few years has been the podcast. It's turned into a remarkable journey for me to meet some incredible people. A TV show is being made. Um, the podcast is becoming a TV show as well, which we start filming in London next year. And so, and that all came about just because of the people I met on the podcast. And I think that at the beginning of a podcasting journey, we, we lean into people that we think would be happy to have a conversation with us that are probably like us, but actually the people that are really valuable to us are the people that are from different worlds. Mm. And those people from different worlds have got, have got a lot to bring. Uh, they, they understand things that you don't understand. They, 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 they work in different you know, parameters and, and different environments to you. So they know different things about different businesses. So I interviewed a guy called Leon Logothetis. He was the guy, the star of a TV show called The Kindness Diaries. And um, at the end of the interview, I said, Leon, I'm a bit jealous. He's like, why? I said, because you've got a TV show and I don't. And uh, he just looked back at me and he went, why not? And I went, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know what to say. I was, blah, blah, blah. I was like, honestly lost the words. I was like, oh, oh. Hey. I, I, was, I, I had no bullshit I could give him or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, I was just totally dumbfounded. He went, I'll give you an hour of my time for the next six weeks, once a week. He said, if you can get the hair on my arms to stand up, give me goosebumps on an idea, then I'll help you make a TV show. Mm. Um, and so we brainstormed every Saturday morning for an hour and uh, some of it was good some of it was bad we kept going backwards and forwards but then came up with an idea producers directors all these people came onto the calls and it was like shit man this is real real um, and yeah we're, and, and so I'm leaning into areas that I care about outside of my professional role you know I, I, I care about kids I care about human trafficking I care about um children being given opportunities and my kids have been very fortunate to get opportunities, but there's lots of kids that aren't. And in, in the, in the West, in the UK, the, the, the opportunities that are given to young people are a million percent better than kids in some other parts of the world. You know, I look 100%. after some children from Bangladesh that, that are married when they reach puberty, um, a gang raped. And, you know, if their skin's dark, they'll never find a man. If their skin's light, they've got a better chance. They live in the slums. They, they just deserve opportunity. And so when I see bad things happening, you know, like all of us, when we see bad things happening, it, it, it upsets us. But for me, I'm fortunate enough to be able to take some action and do something about it. On that, anyone who doesn't, has never gone and listened to the Spencer Lodges podcast, check it out because the stories you I have I've listened to a couple of points in podcasts and I'm really stuff really hits me and I'm like I have to press pause and I have to go like get, like because it I really it gets in my head having kids especially so like it really affects how do you cope with that do you find that you are good at boxing stuff off do you find that some of these podcasts just really take it out of you because your brain's racing with it um so Annika Lucas um, for those of you that are listening to this right now, Annika Lucas um, was sold into a paedophile ring when she was six years old by her mum until she was 11. And politicians used to rape her every weekend. She was from Belgium. And that, I found that really hard. Because when people can tell the story well as well, and they can explain it well, you, you just go into the world that she was in as a kid. Um, but I find, what I do find, though, is some other types of stories. I find them quite fascinating. So I find it fascinating that a girl escaped from the Amish community, you know, and, and started a new life. I found it fascinating, um, the lady that, um, that escaped from North Korea. I mean, she's probably got, out of everyone's story, one of the hardest stories. I mean, the, the madness of her story. So she escapes North Korea, goes to China, gets raped as a baby, gets found out, goes back to North Korea, um, has gangrene in her legs in hospital, was chucked out of the, the prison, escapes again. When she goes to Mongolia to the border, she's going through the barbed wire fences with her son. A man runs towards her. He thinks it's a soldier. And it was a man that helped her. 
and he helped her through and helped her to get out and they went you know through to india and into europe and whatnot she ended up in the uk that guy that helped her through that barbed wire fence was the man she fell in love with and married she moved to the uk she's now a member of a, a councillor for berry near manchester and and this whole journey she's been on it's just like it's so it inspires me to remind myself how incredibly lucky I am, but also that there's people out there and don't judge people always have compassion, understand that, that no matter how bad your day is, someone would dream of that day. And it's always been something that, that just compels me to find out more. And then also I have the funny stories, you know, I have the, the guy that was the biggest diamond thief in America. And I'm like, I said to him, $8 million worth of diamond, you know, why diamonds? Why don't you just steal the money? He's like, if you ever put $8 million in a briefcase. And, and so you get him, you've got the, the drug, the, the drug trafficker from uh, Gloucester that was studying classics at Cardiff. <laughs> Pete, posh Pete, they called him. And he went to prison in Ecuador. You had, you know, you have these people, the, the, the mafia guy, Michael Francisi, that became a born-again Christian. There's really fascinating people out there. Um, but in every single example, uh, every single episode, I learn something. And if I'm touched and I'm moved, then what it does is it creates a little bit of a stronger bond with the guest. And that, that, that means that you can have a network of friends around the world forever because they really appreciate sharing their story with you. Spencer Lodge, this has been fantastic. I genuinely appreciate it. Uh, ladies, gents, if you haven't gone and checked out Spencer Lodge, go and check out the Spencer Lodge podcast. I've lifted some of the episodes on there. And I think your personality really comes across so well. I mean, this has been great. But on your podcast, I think when you're in your own home doing your own podcast, it's you right, on your home venue, you really come out. And I think for anyone who's in sales, who is an entrepreneur, who is looking to get to the level, you're definitely someone that I look up to. Um, and I really appreciate you coming on today. No problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having me. Uh, guys, remember to download, drop a little rating, review, share this out um, and tune in for next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm so glad you popped by. If you've liked this, give it a share, subscribe, even give us a rate and review. Share it out to someone who knows and I look forward to seeing you on the next edition.